our lectureship theme is out of darkness into light, out of atheism into Christianity. And all of these lessons have been designed to kind of build one upon another to lead us to the end of how to obey the gospel and how to live a life as a faithful child of God. So each one is simply a step. We might say walking up the steps to get to the eternity. But I just want to put that uh, before us where we can see it uh, here. We're talking about the seed of woman, and in the amount of time I have, and I'm not even going to, well, I did, I will. I wasn't going to start the uh, timer, but I, I will. But I'm not going to pay attention to it. <coughs> I, I'm the last speaker. I get to give the invitation, so that means I have an open-ended thing. But the seed of woman, our text is going to be taken from Galatians chapter 4, verse 3 through 6. The Apostle Paul said, Even so we, and the we would be Paul and his fellow Hebrews who have obeyed the gospel. When we were children, meaning in the Jewish uh, dispensation, were in bondage under the elements of the world. That means under Judaism. But when the fullness of the time was come, when God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. And that, those words are transitional words. A time of change. To redeem them, that is the Son, to redeem them that were under the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye, and there's the change of pronouns now, our sons, God sent forth His Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And the Spirit of, your, of His Son is the Spirit of Sonship into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So there is our text, but our, again, our theme will be in that, when the fullness of the time was come. All of the Old Testament was pointing, pointing to a time. And when the fullness of it was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, and the woman, there is the seed of the woman. And we'll identify that woman as we proceed. Now, I do this left-handed, so that's going to be a problem. We'll do it right-handed. To redeem them that were under the law, and we're going that direction. <clears throat> the words, made of a woman, I introduce the, my subject, the seed of a woman, but it, this is not the beginning. It refers to the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament starting, again, in the opening pages of the Old Testament. You don't have to turn far. As you open up your Bibles and you turn a few pages, you come to chapter 3 and you come to verse 15. This is after the sin that was committed in the early part of the chapter and the conversation between God and Satan. And God says to Satan, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now this is not a conversation between God and the woman. It's between God and Satan. And so I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it, or he, shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. This is a, the promise that is given. A, we might say the first promise, in fact. It is the protoevangelium. And that's the only complicated word I know how to say. It means in Latin, the first pronouncement of Christ. And so it's a you know, well-known, the whole denominational world understands this is the first pronouncement of Christ. And it points to the cross. And so in the third chapter of the first book of the Bible, we have a prophecy introducing us to the cross of Christ and His death. And that is, I would say, remarkable. It is amazing, but it is more than that. It is prophecy that is certified and confirms the Word of God. The bruising of the, the seeds, the woman's seeds, uh, heal. Uh, Satan doing, or Jesus, Satan bruising the seeds, heal, is on the cross. The death of Jesus on the cross is a figurative bruising of the heel. But Jesus on the cross bruised Satan's head. And that is like a death blow. The other hurts, but 
Not, it doesn't do any death blow. This does a death blow to uh, Satan. This does away with what he has had up until this point. He has kept man in bondage to sin. And by that I mean, there was no means by which man could be forgiven of sin without the blood that was shed on the cross. And so this is what Satan helped man in bondage until that time. Now God, knowing ahead of time, uh, could speak in terms as though it has already happened, and therefore he could forgive man because when God says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. So God can act in a manner as though it has already happened. And so he could then forgive sin. But this is when it actually happens. That is the means by which God was able to give uh, forgiveness of sins. So in the opening pages of the Old Testament, the God of Israel, and God gave to Israel and to us a figurative view of the death of Jesus on the cross. We would say again, quite amazing, but yet more than amazing, inspiration. That is said by inspiration. The seed of woman rendered a death blow to the head of Satan on the cross. Again, man was spiritually freed from the bondage in which Satan had helped man in through all of that time. While the death of Christ on the, and the bruising of the heel of Christ by the way, uh, Satan, uh, the seed of woman again put a death blow to Satan. What looked like a victory was not a victory for Satan at all. It was, in fact, quite a death blow to him. This is the fullness of the time. I'm smiling because we have a very important person coming through the doors back there. <clears throat> the bloodline of Christ is what this is all about. And the bloodline of Christ, which leads us to the seed of woman, was so carefully guarded from Adam and Eve all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament to Jesus until the cultivation of the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus fulfilled, as Miriam pointed out earlier in his lesson, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. We wonder sometimes about the, the, all this begetting in the Old Testament. And we read it and we get kind of bored. Well, there's a reason for it. And that is, it is the bloodline. It is a leading forward to the seed of the woman. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God created he him, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Now you want to know what their name was. It was Adam. In the day that they were created. You don't know that in the first four chapters, but you know it now in the fifth chapter. Their name was Adam. Verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begat. The son of his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. We've already gone past Cain and Abel. One was dead and murdered and the other one had sinned, so that was not the one who through the bloodline would flow. But it would throw, be, flow through Seth. And so this is where the genealogy is, is, is measured. Through Seth, very carefully guarded. And the days of Adam were, uh, after he begat Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And so there were many sons and daughters afterwards. And the, all the days of Adam were 930 years, and he died. God has given us, by inspiration through Moses, the genealogy, the bloodline, of the seed of woman. And that is what it is all about. So don't get bored when you read those begats. They are giving us the bloodline. The seed of woman is being traced. Verse 6, And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And then of course it goes on in the book. The bloodline runs through Seth. And we can't go on with that because we have to hurry along. But Noah then is in the bloodline. In chapter 10, in verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, and that would be the one through whom the bloodline flows. Ham and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. The bloodline now runs through Shem. There were three sons, but the bloodline runs through one. 
Not through the three, but through one. In the flood, God was saving the bloodline that was to bring forth the seed of the woman. We all know about the flood, and we know what happened. But Shem and his wife were on the ark, and the ark was the place of safety. And they were being saved from sin that was being destroyed by the water, and so they, the water was the means of safety. Following the great flood, Moses picks up the genealogy once more as time moves forward then. This brings us to a very important change in the history of the Old Testament. God prepares to protect the bloodline. Once more, it is in danger. It was in danger because of the wickedness in the time of Noah, and God protected the bloodline. He saved Noah and Shem by putting them on the ark and destroying sin. But it is once more in danger, and God acts. God prepares to protect the bloodline as the time marches forward and towards the fullness of the time. Remember, we're going in the fullness of the time. We're going towards a time. We would say the time. So the Old Testament is a history of the bloodline which leads to the seed of the woman. It is in the generations of Terah, who is the father of Abram, that Moses uh, covers uh, the next move as he goes forward again to Abram, who is Abraham to us, uh, as we look at it. Abram will now become the key historical figure as God will take the promise or make a promise to Abram, which becomes the promise now from the time it's made through the end of the Old Testament and then into the New Testament. And so it is the promise of the Old Testament and the New Testament. This promise is the foundation, in fact, of our text. And that may surprise you, but it is. And if you study Galatians, you'll see that. And so it is the foundation upon uh, this seed promise in which we read in Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 6. Uh, and so if chapter 4 is built upon this promise that God makes to Abraham. Let's go read this in chapter 3, verses 24 through 29. For, for the law was our schoolmaster, and the R there would be Hebrews, not Gentiles, Hebrews, schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by the faith. But after the faith has come, that is, after the faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. That would be the law of Moses. For we are all children of of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for we are all one in Christ Jesus if we have been baptized into Christ we are all one in Christ Jesus what does that mean and if you be Christ possessive then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's the promise that we're going to study about in just a moment. And that is the seed, the seed promise that we're going to get to in a moment. This is what chapter 4 is built upon. It is built upon the seed promise because it tells us the fulfillment of it. When the fullness of the time was come, the seed promise that God gave to Abraham was fulfilled. And again, that is the seed. We will say, who is the seed? Who is this seed of Abraham? In Galatians 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as unto one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And that's why if we're baptized into Christ... We belong to Christ and we are the heirs of the promise made to Christ. And that is what the foundation of chapter 4 is built upon. The promise. And that's why we go back and pick up the genealogy now of Abram. In Genesis 11 verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahar and Haram. And Haram begot Lot. And Lot plays a role in that history. 
So God's plan is marching towards or forward through the Old Testament to the fullness of the time and uh, the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abram. God made this promise while Abram uh, was in Ur of Chaldees. Now sometimes we miss that. We think Abraham or it was somewhere else. But Ur, Abraham or Abram is still in Ur of Chaldees when, he makes the, when God makes the promise. Genesis uh, 12 verse 1. And the Lord had said. Do you get that? And the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country. Well, when did God tell Abram to get thee out of thy country? While he was in thy, the country. And he was in Ur of Chaldees, and God said to him, While he was in Ur of Chaldees, get out of it, and get it from thy country, the kindred, and from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. Now what had God said? And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now he said other things in regard to the nation and so forth. But this is what we're focusing in on because we're looking for the seed of woman. And so he says to Abram, And in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And what did Paul say about the seed of Abram? It's Christ. And what did our text say? In the fullness of the time, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. That seed was Christ. And so we can tie that together as we think about it. And so through Abraham, the promise is made that in his seed should all families of the earth be blessed. That seed is Christ, and there's where the blessings are. And so the promise is pointing to the seed of woman then. But then in Genesis chapter 17, verses 4 through 6, God is speaking, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, Abram, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. And now we can get more comfortable because we can call him Abraham now. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. But this is not all as it leads to the bloodline. There's more to the story. God is talking now to Abraham. But Abraham is not all of it. And the seed of woman runs together now. The promise to Abraham, but there's more to it than Abraham. If we only think of Abraham, we're just getting half the story. Notice as he goes on, verses 15 to 16. And God said unto Abram, And for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her a name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. And that son is very important to this bloodline and the seed of woman. Yea, and I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations and kings of people shall be of her. A covenant is now made. And God said to Sarah, And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son. Still talking to Abraham. But he says, thy wife, Sarah now, not Sarai, but Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son. Indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. He even gives the name by which the son is now to be called. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And this is the nation of Israel. Now it is important to note this covenant is made with the seed through Sarah, not with a seed made through Hagar. This is the seed of woman and it's going to run through Sarah, not through Hagar, not through Terah, which would be... Uh, or his other wife, and I can't think of that name now. Uh, but anyway, Abraham did marry again and had children after Sarah died, but it wasn't through those seeds either. It is through Sarah. And Sarah had one child, Isaac. And he is the one. And he is the only one, if we can use those terms. And so the bloodline and the seed of woman continues to go through Sarah. No one else. And God would make the promise then to Isaac, who came through Sarah. Genesis 26, verse 4, And I will make thy seed to multiply, talking to Isaac here, multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thee thy seed of these countries, and thy seed 
and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. That same promise. Yes, there are other promises, but we're looking at the one promise. That in his seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. That's the promise that Paul is talking about in Galatians. And that promise was also made to Jacob. So we have it made to Abraham, we have it made to Isaac, and we have it made to Jacob. Genesis 28, 14. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. That's just like Israel and so forth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in thee. And thy seed shall be... And thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Those same words are repeated. And that's what we're looking at in thy seed. Keep in mind this becomes the promise of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Again, directly as we look at the words of our text. And what are we talking about? In the fullness of the time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. He identifies the time while the law is still in, is, is still in force, made under the law. It would not be after the old law was done away with. It would be while the law was still in effect. In fact, he would be the means by which the old law would be removed in, as far as it being enforced went. Well, let's turn our attention now to Isaiah's virgin because we're looking at the seed of woman. In Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give thee a sign. Now, a sign is more than something remarkable or something amazing. Those things happen all the time. A sign is something that is beyond natural law. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and that's beyond natural law. And bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel being God with us. And what does our text say? And in the fullness of the time, when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth, what? His son, made of a woman. His son. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. His son would be Emmanuel, God with us. And so everything in this text points to the seed of woman. Everything about it. The Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, as the translators were translating from Hebrew into Greek. I believe there were 70 of them. And they came to this Alma. And it's, the Greek is Parthenos. And what does it mean? Now these are uninspired translators from Hebrew to Greek. They know both languages. And they come to this, this word in Isaiah's text. God will show you a sign. Behold a Alma, if that's the way you say that word. It means a virgin, a marriageable maiden, a woman who had never had sex or intercourse with a man. That's the word they used. How did they understand it? They understood it to be a virgin. Well, nowadays, they don't understand it that way. But back in about 280 B.C., they understood it that way. Those 70 understood you translate Hebrew into Greek, and this is the word. But this is the same word the inspired writer Matthew used when he came to quote Isaiah in Matthew 1.23. And so the Jewish scholars picked the same word that the Holy Spirit picked when he had Matthew quote Isaiah 7.14. Behold, a Parthenos shall be with child. By man, I could say that's, that's impossible outside of this artificial insemination we have today. But back then it was impossible without it being a miracle. And shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which Matthew now tells us, which means being interpreted God with us. In the fullness, or when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman. 
That's exactly what Isaiah is talking about. Notice with me, if you do, that what is removed when we allow Satan and his agents to remove virgin from Isaiah's and Matthew's words. First, you remove the harmony between Isaiah and Matthew. If one says virgin, but the other one doesn't. One's Hebrew, remember. The other one is Greek. So you have them out of harmony. That means what? Well, that means that you also, second, removed inspiration. Third, you have removed God with us, the Emmanuel, out of the text. Fourth, you have removed the Word, which means the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, because the Word dwelt among us, or the words, means Emmanuel. In other words, that's the definition of it. Fifth, you have removed the Son of God. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of the woman. And that's the virgin. Six, you remove God's love, who so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It's not His Son. Not if it's not a virgin. It's not God's Son. It's just fornication. Seventh, you remove the sacrifice for sin. If it's not the Son that came by means of God, it's, it's not the sacrifice for sin because it's just another man who commits sin. Eighth, you have removed redemption, our redemption, if it's not the virgin. Ninth, you have removed our salvation. You see what happens when we begin to mess around with the words of inspiration. And you see what Satan's aim is when he wants to tell you, oh, that, can't, that doesn't mean virgin. He's removing all that is important to us when it happens. Tenth, you remove the meaning of the words of the text. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of womb, made under the law. Now I want to call your attention to Matthew and his words now. 118. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. This is the way it happened. When as his mother Mary was the spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she's still a virgin, she was found with child of, oh, not Joseph, but some other man, right? No, that's not what it says. It says of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is God. One of that which is God. God third member of the Godhead, as we style it. Not man, but God. Of the Holy Spirit, not of man. Therefore, it's the seed of woman, not man. It is a virgin. And the child is of God. And so it is the Son of God. And there is Isaiah's virgin. There is Isaiah's Emmanuel, God with us. And no wonder the devil is busy trying to tell us the virgin does, is not a virgin. That's not what the word means. The 70 knew better, and the Holy Spirit, of course, knew better. Now let's look at made of a woman. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Both made, the word made here is the same Greek word. Yeah, I'm not going to pay attention to that, Mary. <laughs> On this clear guy, i got 12 minutes. <laughs> God is eternal. God is, I am that I am, I exist because I exist. There, there's no beginning, He's eternal. The text says, the Son of God made of a woman. Made. Jesus of Nazareth had a beginning. Now God has no beginning, but Jesus of Nazareth had a beginning. The seed of woman had a beginning. The word made is from this uh, in the text. Made of woman is the Greek genome. And what does it mean? To become, to come into existence, to begin to be, to receive being. Now remember I said God exists. I am that I am. I exist because I exist. 
So God did not come into existence when Jesus of Nazareth was conceived. But the fleshly Jesus of Nazareth did. When Mary conceived, when Mary was with child, Jesus of Nazareth began to be. He came to be, or came into being. That fleshly part came into being. That's the seed of woman. And so when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. That's where the flesh came from. Deity already existed, but the flesh did not. It had a beginning. And it began in that conception. And conception and child there means the same idea. Now nowhere is this more clearly revealed as we look at it than in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 through 8. This is a beautiful text and I cannot give you all that it means. I can just kind of give you a, a very brief summary of this beautiful text. First, and I'm breaking it down into phrases. Who, and we're talking about when it says in verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, now we're not talking about the fleshly Jesus here. We're talking about He who was in the form of God. And that word means the form, the word form. He bore the form, the, the sovereignty of God, all that is God. As viewed by the inhabitants of heaven. In other words, we say the second member of the Godhead. And when the angels looked at God the Father, and they looked at God the Son, and looked at God the Holy Spirit, they saw the same thing. I don't, I, I, we have trouble describing all that, but when you, they saw the same thing, there were no difference in them except being. And we have trouble with all that, but that's kind of the way it is. They saw God. All the qualities were the same. Second, Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And the word robbery gives us some trouble. We think of a, you know, a thief or something along that way. That's not it. Here's what the idea is. He did not think that his maintaining that sovereignty with God or that which was God or is God was to be eagerly clung to or to retain at the cost of mankind's eternal damnation. In other words, had He stayed in heaven and never become flesh, we would never be saved. And He said, I'm willing to do something different. I'm willing to become flesh and blood. And so He changed locations and changed something there. Again, we have some hard times understanding. But he viewed our salvation that important. Third, but made himself of no reputation in that he stripped himself of the privileges and the rights of deity. And you'll see how he did that here as we look at it. So fourth, took upon him in the form of a servant. Deity doesn't serve. Man does. And so he took upon him the form of a servant, as seen in the garden when he prayed, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. Now here's Jesus praying, and he says, not my will, but the will of God, be it Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, has the same will, right? But Jesus says, not my will, but thine be done. It's the humanity of Jesus that is praying. And he wanted to live. He, he was suffering. He knew the agony that was before him. The dying on the cross was torturous. One of the most torturous ways to die of any. And he wanted to live. He, he knew that, the pain. But he said, so not my will now. Oh, I want, I want to live. If, if this cup can be removed and we can still save humanity, that's what, let's do that. Nevertheless, in order to save man, thy will be done. That's kind of the idea of it. So in that humanity, he prayed, not my will. Deity's will be done. Fifth, was made in the likeness of man, or men. 
Not being seen in the form of God now, but in the likeness of man, hungry, thirsty, lonely, and suffering. Those are not words described when we look at God. Can you think of God being hungry? Fish and bread? No. Man does, though. And Jesus was at times. Remember at the well? He was thirsty. Six. Being found in fashion as a man. And the man said, If there is a way, but not my will, thine be done. In all that in is humanity, even to the point of being tempted to sin, that's the humanity he became. That began at that conception when Mary was with child. Seventh, he humbled himself. He was ranked below others who are honored above him. Seeing as he stood before Pilate. And I love the words of that song. Now you've got to view this. Jesus is before Pilate, and Pilate is the, the king. He's the one with the authority, and here's Jesus. As deity, he could have called 10,000 angels. But in his humanity, he died for us. I think those words, if you look at them in that way, mean a lot to us, don't they? That's Jesus. He humbled himself. Eighth, he became obedient unto death. Like all mankind, he was subject to death. It is appointed unto man once to die. Deity does not die. Deity is not born. But flesh and blood is. And the seed of woman was. It came into existence. Humanity died. Not deity. Humanity. Ninth, even the death of the cross. So not just death of old age. Not just death by accident. But death upon the cross. A torturous brutality. As a criminal, he died. That's the seed of woman. In those words we have... We are taken back to the Proto-Evangelium of the Bible, the first pronouncement of Christ. And what do we have? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, God said, between thy seed and her and, he, and her between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And when the fullness of the time was come. God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. And that's what we see in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. That's what God is talking about. The death of Christ upon the cross. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth His Spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And how grateful we are that in our hearts we have the spirit of sonship because God said to the serpent he's going to bruise your head and I'm going to forgive man of their sins when they obey the gospel of Christ we have the opportunity to obey the gospel of Christ at this time to believe it to repent of your sins to confess Jesus Christ, and that means to confess your loyalty to Him and to be baptized. As we stand and sing, will you come at this time?